Hello, everyone, and welcome to Pricing Matters. Today, we are pleased to have on Tom Roberts, the Global SVP of Software Partner Solutions at SAP. Welcome, Tom, and thanks for joining us. Hello, Gabe. Good to see you again. Yeah, you too, Tom. It's great talking with you again. You know, we've been connected for many years and done a lot of events and, and various things together. But um, for people that don't know who you are or know what you do at SAP and uh, specifically, you know, about maybe the partner programs and, you know, software partner solutions, maybe can you introduce yourself and a little bit about those and uh, maybe focus in on the SAP and Doorstop program that PriceFX is part of? I'd love to. You know, Gabe, uh, my role here at SAP is really to make partners like your, yourself successful. So uh, I run software partner solutions for SAP globally. And what that means is that SAP, of course, goes out of its way to try to cultivate a really rich and powerful ecosystem of software partners designed to help our customers meet their needs. Uh, SAP, as big as we are, we can't code everything and we can't deliver every solution so we rely heavily on partners like yourselves to fill the gaps and make sure that our customers can run their business end to end. So we've been at this for, for a number of years, but the new news still is that at last year's Sapphire, we announced something called Endorsed Apps. Uh, you're one of our premier partners inside Endorsed Apps. And what is it? it it's really the ability for our customers to come to the SAP store, or sometimes we call it the digital marketplace, and be able to look at a curated set of solutions that are gonna help them run their business better. And PriceFX is one of the solutions in endorsed apps. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about the continued evolution of the partner programs and particularly around the endorsed apps, which makes it easier for, you know, particularly cloud-based vendors like ourselves um, to integrate in with the, you know, SAP environment, but then also having the customers with the, you know the the kind of trust and certifications and and you know the the confidence that comes with the, those those uh, those certifications. So, you know what I like about SAP is that you kind of get the fact that pricing optimization and management is a thing, is its own space, and it's very deep and rich in terms it of sure the capabilities is. that are required. And I'd say really SAP is the only mega vendor that gets it. Um, and I'd say probably your fingerprints are somewhat on that um, on that uh, you know line of way of thinking so thank you for that um, but but uh, yeah I mean as compared to you know some of your competitors where they they think they have optimization but they really don't or they're trying to kind of make forays into optimization but it's really not very deep and they don't really get that there's you know what what we we actually you know we call ourselves price effects but what we actually sell is a profitability management platform, right? An optimization platform. And, and it really helps our clients manage that whole price waterfall, right? From the way that you set the price to the way you negotiate an on invoice, off invoice, account for cost of goods, cost to serve, and really enable better outcomes to that whole process. Um, and I know SAP has various things that touch those other processes, but it really works together quite nicely when we you know, are able to bring some of that power to an SAP client, bring some of the data in from SAP and then be pushing, you know, uh, pricing conditions and, and quotes and things out into SAP so it can transact very quickly. Let's let's talk about your personal background a little bit here. Um, so you got an MBA from Wharton, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Uh, you know, actually, I never completed Wharton. What oh, happened really? was, oh, okay. and this is an interesting story, and I'm, I'm proud to tell it, you know, I got very interested in certain classes that I wanted to take at Wharton. Uh -huh. um, and I, and I attended there for a number of years, but I, I never completed. And here's why, you know, um, I was my wife and I were raising two kids at the time. And I made a decision that says, you know, there's a bunch more accounting classes here. I have no interest in um, to complete this. And I said, I've gotten the value out of the, the education that I wanted. And, it, it, and that's when it sort of dawned on me is that, you know, you pay for things that you really value. And to me, necessarily having a, a, a stamp that said MBA isn't really why I went. I went to learn certain things around strategic alliances and around some other things. And I really, really got some great benefits from it. But I, I never completed my MBA, um, but I do value the time that I spent there. And, and, and it also you know, made me very aware of that, that price to value relationship. Was, it, yeah. was that price right for me to go ahead and finish that versus that. And maybe that's a great segue into our topic as sort of price to value and the decision making that people that people make. Yeah, no, I think I think definitely value based pricing is a, is a great topic. and We can spend some time on it. But one thing that I wanted to ask you is, 
Um, you know, we've seen that there's been an increase in focus and kind of understanding around pricing and the impact of pricing um, in various MBA programs. Um, you know, there's, for example, University of Rochester, Simon Business School has a pricing focused MBA program, and we've done some work jointly with them. But we're seeing that in general, it, this seems to be coming up more at the C level. Um, and I was interested to get your take on that. Are you, are you seeing that as well from you, from where you sit, that there's kind of an increasing awareness and uh, focus on on pricing optimization as a profit there, lever? Gabe, there really is. And, you know, let's let's think about where the technology is going and then where also markets are going, right? As markets have gotten really complex and as technologies evolved, you could do things that were only theoretical in the past, right? Like reacting to real time changes in commodities and having that flow all the way through, um, you know, to, to, to pricing as an output. Um, that was nice to have somebody put that down on a piece of paper and have theory about it and teach theory about it. But now the systems are coming to the point where you can actually execute on things like that and you could never in the past. So I see more and more emphasis on pricing. As you said, it's the direct lever to profitability. Everybody is always focused on profitability. And if you don't have your handle around what happens within this business process, it's the difference between winning and losing. It, it, it's plain and simple. So it's right. not surprising that inside the major business schools, pricing has emerged as one of the top things that they're focusing on. Yeah. Yeah. And we're seeing like an increasing level of spend and, and focus as digital transformation, I think, is is taking more and more root across different industries and companies that you know this this idea of being agile right enabling business agility and and commercial agility uh that has to be uh you know done in consideration of pricing and really uh, in some cases pricing should be at the forefront as you mentioned in certain industries where there's been so much volatility with supply chain with with cost with competition uh industry consolidation increased transparency um and so you know you get it in this place where at, when you look at that kind of value chain, you know, from, you know, the the commodity suppliers to the the component suppliers to the kind of finished goods suppliers uh, and then distributors and, and retailers, what happens, it seems like what's happening is that, you know, as this gets deployed, this kind of technology gets deployed and people digitally transform their processes, it it kind of becomes like a musical chairs or like a hot potato, right? Where it's like right. whoever whoever's the slowest ends up experiencing the margin compression, right? Correct. And and so, and what we're seeing is that you can actually use some intelligence. Um, if you're depending on where you are in that value chain, you can actually use some of the intelligence that's that's signaling certain things that are going to happen even before they do, and you can actually use that to your advantage. So if you're, you know, a, a manufacturer and you have you know a lot of steel in your products, before your supplier actually increases the prices, you can actually see what's happening with the steel index and you can predict that that's gonna happen. And you can actually adjust your pricing and create float off of that event rather than waiting for them to do it and then struggling to respond to it, right? So it's really about being more proactive rather than reactive um, and, and being able to enable you know value for the company. Um, I always find these trends that, and, and you talked about this volatility and you're seeing it right now play out in front of our eyes. There's always this optimism that, oh, it will go back to normal and we'll absorb this, right? So because people are not price agile, and then what they begin to find out is that, look, what if what if underlying the change in the pricing is actually macro trends like uh, the devaluation of a currency, right? And it, which which you can see playing out. If you don't react to that, now you're getting a double whammy, right? Yeah. You're, you're still charging at an old rate. You know, your price is still fixed to that that particular currency. Yet you're experiencing the increase in the margin compression associated with the commodities underlying it. Now you're not only just struggling from a pricing standpoint, you're getting hit on both fronts because you haven't put the pricing agility into place. And I'll honestly say, I think because technology is where it's at, the ability to react to those things does exist now, and those who don't will fail. That's why they say, look, uh, of the of the of the Fortune 50, they say in the next 10 years, less than five of them will still be in the Fortune 50, and this is why, right? A lack of agility around this reacting to how the market changes gives them no ability. Well, they say, hey, it's always been priced that way, and they just ignore it. Suddenly, it's to their peril. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and and you get that combined with things like channel disruption, you know, thing, you know, w- with trends like, you know, Amazon coming in and, and disrupting all these markets and the direct to consumer, you know, thing that's happening and it's disrupting a lot of the, you know, standard distribution uh, markets and it just it just changes the dynamics and and it really um you know it's really all about in in any environment um and I've talked a lot about this a lot on the podcast it's really about understanding it to come back to what you were talking about the value right understanding what the customers value being able to structure your 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 whatever offer is whether it's services or product or combination thereof and and price that in a way that reflects that value and really stay close to it uh, and, and understand how you can differentiate that value and then and then capture that value with price, right? And, and so that's what it comes down to. And that's easy to say. And it's again, it's easy to do in theory, right? But when you're at a you know complex multi-billion dollar you know company like a lot of SAP clients and our clients are, that you know, it's it's very difficult to execute, right? Especially in spreadsheets or and you know, or you're not or doing using, it in a spreadsheet, right? Right, right exactly. <laughs> no chance. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Well, I think, you know, you mentioned at the top, SAP has been, you know, when it comes to the enterprise space, have been much more attuned to this pricing aspect of of what our customers' business process is. And I think it has a lot to do with those customers, major SAP customers running SAP as their ERP and linking that to the front office, understanding that connection from order entry all the way through manufacturing, and then being able to manage in a single system the understanding of what the underlying costs are for manufacturing, plus the costs associated with the materials headed into it, and aligning that against the demand signals coming from the market. If you don't have your handle around those three, then you're going to struggle, uh, right. without a doubt. Yeah, yeah, um, and um, you know, I want to touch on this this term that SAP uses that I that I find pretty compelling, and I think we help enable, which is the the intelligent enterprise, right? And, and, uh, and, you know, I think when you look at, you know, there's this idea of there's tons of data out there now, right? And people have been really kind of, in some cases, been struggling to get their hands around that data and get it structured in a way that you can actually use it in intelligent ways. Um, and now I think that's some of that work's like been done now. And, and I think we're getting to a place now where a lot of companies have data that's structured and you can actually start using it in various ways to make better decisions. And, and that's obviously what's happening in the pricing space, right? Where you're able to use AI and, and use machine learning to, you know, ha- figure out how to segment and optimize pricing. And then um, not just in a, in a kind of standalone place, but actually embed that intelligence into the everyday business process, right? Both from a, you know, a process perspective, a tools perspective, and, and obviously a systems and data perspective as well, right? So I, I think to me, that's really how you turn data into intelligence and how you enable an intelligent enterprise. And and that's, um, I, I'd just be kind of curious to get your your perspective on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I always go back to this and you know, people say, you know, why did SAP move their flagship S4 onto HANA and make it S4 HANA? Whereas, you know, we always used to run on things like um, Oracle's database or, or SQL Server or even IBM. I think the, the the key difference is exactly this, right? More and more the data or the information you care about lives in the application layer. For years, it was always, oh, rows and columns inside the database. Mm-hmm. So you could access the database and and yeah, as long as you understood the schema, you you could extract the data and take it somewhere else and do something else with it. Enterprises are so dynamic now, the real challenge is managing that data inside the context of what's happening in the business process. And there's only one way you can do that. And that's with something like HANA that can handle both the OLTP, the transactional side of it, as well as the analytical side of it and not have to move the data. I look at how much money companies spend pushing data here and pushing data there, whereas if they could just leverage it without having to move it, they'd be much better off. And this is, of course, the strength of what was designed. And I think it was that forward thinking that said, this isn't going to hold. This model of shuttling the data in and out and then trying to reconcile isn't going to work. Now, let's start to apply that to a concept as as real-time focused as being able to quote or deliver pricing associated with a business process. So you're, you're, you're at order entry and you're trying to figure out how much to charge for X. 
Well, you need information across the entire enterprise in real time to be able to come back and tell you that and then optimize it for that specific customer. You're not going to do that in a scenario where you're shuttling data all over the place. That's not going to work. And I, and I think this is one of the things that differentiates SAP as a market leader and as somebody that really gets it and understands what you have to be to be agile and have an intelligent enterprise versus an old school thinking way of, uh, of coming about it, which is where our competitors are at. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, we have some clients, SAP clients that are actually um, calling out to us. This isn't, this isn't our standard model, but actually I like this model and I wish more, more of our clients would go in this direction where, where they're calling out to us to actually execute pricing for, out of out of their ERP, out of ECC or or S4 HANA, right? And, and so, um, and so they're rather than you know us doing all this thing and then sending over pricing conditions into into SAP, which is what we do at a lot of our clients. We have some clients that are actually calling us via API in real time because it's very dynamic. Whether it's you know based on right. commodities, based on competition, based on whatever whatever it is, and so they're just providing us. Okay, here's the customer. Here's what they're asking for. Here's the quantity. Here's the timelines. And then we say, okay, here's the price, and and maybe it's a few, maybe it's an envelope of price that says, you know, here's the target, and here's the stretch, and oh. here's the floor, or something like this. But that 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 kind of environment, uh, you know, those more dynamic, I think that's that's increasing, uh, you know, in terms of its um, applicability across different different industries, right? Is is really trying to get that dynamic, and uh, you know, I've I've uh, was talking at a PPS event, uh, cup, well, the last in person one they did was actually I think it was October of 2019. <laughs> Wow. Um, and uh, Chuck Davenport from Bain was talking there, is, and he was talking about dynamic pricing, and and uh, and that the definition of what dynamic uh, pricing means really varies a lot by industry. Like we think about, you know, competitive dynamic pricing in e-commerce, right? That's the kind of standard airline but tickets, right? Airline yeah. tickets or surge pricing or what have you. But but what like what we're talking about with with commodity indices or or other indicators, you know, where. Um, you know, we're pricing anything from ski tickets in Switzerland to, you know, steel drums to, um, you know, commodity chemicals to electronics to the, you know, finished electronics goods to the components. And so, you know, each of those has its own needs around how dynamic it needs to be. But the the nice thing about, you know, price effects as a platform, and I think SAP and S4 HANA as well, is it can be as dynamic as you need it to be, right? And, and so, it, all the way to we have customers that are literally pricing in real time based on getting competitive data in, you know, every 15 minutes where they're outputting a price. As soon as that comes in, we're outputting a new price to their e-commerce system. Right. And so so that's, you know, I think um, what I'm seeing is over the last five years is a, a huge increase in in the needs around that because of all of these disruptions with supply chain and and you got the demand side happening as well right really it started off kind of with the trade and tariff wars it, it seemed like and some of that well but even before that you had a fair amount of volatility on the commodity side right and then you get the yeah. the tariff trade thing happening and then you get covid happening and it's just like one thing after another and, and now we've got inflation happening where you know people are struggling to to you know keep up with the ppi and cpi right hey what's the one consistent in there right which is yeah. People keep thinking that it's going to settle down right. and that it's going to go back to the way it was. And the reality is it, it, it isn't. And if you haven't moved to this agile mindset around pricing, you really put your company behind the eight ball, right? You, you, you have, if you, if you keep denying it, that there isn't going to be the next thing that causes pricing to have to be uh, more responsive and more personalized, you're kidding yourself. Yeah. For sure, yeah, and and I think some of these disruptions and and some of the issues with supply chain actually could have been made better if they had more dynamic pricing capabilities at at certain points in the value chain, right? We talked a little bit about that before, where, you know, you get um, this this kind of musical chairs thing happening, where you know if you've got a a, a manufacturer that's really good at at you know pricing optimization, they can kind of flex their pricing to meet the you know supply demand whatever that is, but. You know, if you get a component supplier that's not good at it, then all of a sudden, you know, and someone sees, oh, wait, there's a supply chain disruption happening and they just go buy up all of those components. And now none of the other manufacturers can actually build anything. Right. This is happening with everything from, you know, bikes to chicken wings to, you know, to lumber. Right. I, I, lumber is like they're saying is increase the price of a home like thirty nine thousand dollars because of lumber shortages. Right. Um, so it's it's really something that, um, you know, that is i think more and more 
uh, playing itself out in, in different places. And 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 you're right. I don't think it's going to change. I think it's only going to. I mean, the the other thing that I'm interested to get your take on is so SAP has you know products around procurement, right? Ariba and and these kind of things, and then and it has products around pricing and. And and there's more and more intelligence and you know AI and things being deployed there. At some point, it's just going to be machines buying from other machines, right? And and I, I want I'm I'm curious to get your take on this because I was just talking to uh, a a prospect that I won't name, but they they are running SAP and and they were really interested in this kind of marketplace type of pricing, um, you know, and and what we could p- potentially do to like. Be interfacing directly with a procurement system, for example, to to enable more agility and more intelligence in that process. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Or do I do, you- and 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 I think you know you mentioned dynamic pricing, and everybody uses the example. I think you use ski tickets or airline, you know, airline tickets, right? Is the one like, hey, the guy in the seat next to you paid fifty dollars more or fifty dollars less than you did, yeah. and people have adapted to that. Like on on a gut level, there's always a feeling like, well, that's unfair, but also, the immediately behind that is the transparency of, well, why is that, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, it was the time it was bought, bought way in advance or had flexibility and could buy last minute. And people begin to understand those whys. And then as that transparency comes up, now this procurement uh, uh, to pricing example is going to be the same way. Do I think it's inevitable? I 100% think it's inevitable. Here's why. All things have this sort of elastic availability, and they also have a time dimension to them when you need them and what you're going to do. I think as we look at things like the perfect market, we always refer to as the stock market, where algorithms battle back and forth to try to seek best price, you're going to see that in the enterprise as well. We're going to see that tomorrow? No, we're not. But Pricing is optimization is becoming more and more sophistication, sophisticated, and procurement is becoming more and more sophisticated. And as that battle goes on, those algorithms will be the only way to seek the next bit of advantage, either by saying, I'm going to buy a little bit more so I achieve a discount, and I'm going to buy it at a certain time when I know some of this is, and I'm going to arbitrage that against where I'm going to inventory it, where I'm going to store it. and mm-hmm. and those decisions are best left to the machines because they can do them very, very quickly as long as people understand what those different aspects are, just like that airline seat. If you buy early, you get lower. Those things exist on both sides. We know they do. We know that procurement always strives to get pricing that if they if if they either pay or they buy at certain times, the price is going to fluctuate. Yeah. And this is going to hold all the way through. And the further you go down into the, you know, into the value chain, down into the commodities, the more you can see it, mm-hmm. right? You Absolutely. Can, you can see it gets much more like what happens on Wall Street. And I think it, 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 if companies aren't planning for that inevitability, certainly in the largest global companies they are, but the more you can start to think that way, the more that's going to play out to your favor, to your benefit. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, I've seen companies also at larger, uh, you know, procurement events, they'll actually create hedges against, you know, commodities. And yeah. so based on the way that the contract's structured, but you could envision a world where that actually becomes automated as well, right? So so you have a certain contract structure and it, it, it's it's referencing some commodity index and you realize there's, you know, this much potential and it, it creates an opportunity to, to hedge and, and that could all be automated in the future, right? Whereas yeah, now it's like- as you see, as this volatility drives interest in, in uh, vertical integration, more control, more span of control within your supply chain is always favorable when volatility is higher. Now, I use a simple example, right? I'm buying a shed and I'm buying it from an uh, from an Amish uh, company. Well, they also happen to have vertical control around the supply of the wood. So they're not as greatly affected as either by the shortages or the price spike because right. they're more vertically integrated. Now, that's a small example, but you can see how much of a difference that can make as things become unstable yeah. and become more volatile. They're able yep. to maintain their pricing in a much more consistent manner and still be able to deliver their profitability because they have more vertical control. Yeah, that's why Costco runs chicken farms so they can keep their <laughs> rotisserie chickens at five bucks, right? <laughs> And um, you can never buy more than one. They always have that limit on there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. 
but that, I mean, that's, and that's, you know, that's a key value item, right? So they're using that as a draw to get you into the store and they're really focused on that, that set of things. Um, milk is another one that they do a good job at their bread, right? The, some of those KVIs and, and, uh, you know, to get people into the store and then you end up spending $400 in your market basket, right? So that's, yeah. that's classic retail pricing strategy. It's really right? smart. Yeah, it is. Um, all right, so um, let's let's shift gears a little bit. So you you know one of the things that we wanted to talk about a little bit is you get a lot of exposure to the um, you know partner ecosystem, um, particularly on the software side of things, right? And and there's various trends um, like moving from perpetual to subscription and the impact on how companies are run, how how we sell, how we go to market. Um, and so, and then I'm sure there's a lot of SAP clients as well that are maybe from more traditional uh, manufacturing backgrounds or, or other industries that where they're looking on taking, moving to subscriptions, right? So as, the, and as they're, you know, moving or looking at changing monetization models, one of the things that I've talked about in the past is it, it really gives companies uh, an, an opportunity to look at what, what are those value metrics, right? Uh, and how should I be pricing this? Because you know it, the widget might not be the best way, right? Um, there's there's very you know I have uh, you know run across various examples from you know pricing um, you know instead of pricing light bulbs, pricing you know uh, uptime on lighting a parking lot or a building or or uh, you know I was at a pricing conference where a CEO of a of a dirt company was talking about how he differentiated his pricing of dirt based on how wow. long how long a customer was willing to wait in line for it, right? So they that that's a brilliant you know you take a lot of these companies they think you, they think oh it's a commodity the market sets it but if you really look at and you really stay close to customers and understand what they value you know even a a customer that's buying dirt which is arguably the most commoditized thing in the world right uh, you you realize like well what they value is if you don't get them that dirt, if they have to wait in line for an hour, their whole operation is waiting for that dirt because they have to pour a foundation and compact it, right? And so, you know, pay, they'll pay a lot more to not have to do that, right? It's the delivery of it, yeah. right? That timing, yeah. that was that time aspect of dynamic pricing that is the one that's, you know, people always worry that that, that dynamic pricing could be discriminatory in some way, but it's actually time is always that driver that, some people will pay more for sooner, right? Yeah, and yeah. they just will. And if you and if your market can support that, then that's a that's a trend. Now, this aspect of on-prem versus SaaS and and, and paying subscription basically instead of owning the intellectual property and then paying maintenance on it. I think for years the software business did you know did did two things. It would get paid up front for a license. But then it would also charge the maintenance on the back on the back side of it. So is it a huge leap to say, hey, there's really just one charge, and what you're really paying for is the maintenance? Not so much. I mean, the underlying compute underneath it helps centralize that and take a lot of cost out of the enterprise. Because let's be honest, there was a lot of redundant hardware across a lot of enterprise data centers, especially when you consider that they would have to build their own data center for their own peak usage. And then couldn't really effectively share, aside from a handful of very smart companies, would share or offload their unused capacity. So you had lots of zombie servers taking up lots of electricity, a lot of capital expenditure. So it's quite natural that that glut was going to get hit with cloud computing and a consolidation around it. Does it have to go all the way to full multi-tenant for everything? Maybe not. You know that that's that's that can be argued for another day. But the reality is, is that the consolidation of data centers so that loads can be shared and, and, and that those costs can be cut, there is a huge opportunity there. And you can see that's what's turned into the hyperscalers business. Do they always want to charge based on uh, subscription? Yeah, it's best because what's at the very root of it? Sort of an electric bill, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and you, you, don't, you don't own the power plant. You just pay for what you need. So it was pretty natural that that type of pricing was going to dominate. And I think technology will continue on down that route um, inevitably, right? It yeah. is, it, you're going to pay as you need it and it will get more and more sophisticated, the level of services that you can pay for as you need. Um, does that mean that the technology industry won't be, won't have as high a margins? Probably. Uh, I, I think that's reality, but that's also the case of where it's at in its life cycle, just like any other businesses, as things mature, profitability um, does come under pressure, 
Yeah, it's yeah. Not, more competition, decreased willingness to pay as as things yeah. become, you know, uh, yeah. more commoditized. It's it's Supply natural. And demand. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it, it's kind of crazy. Speaking of agility, when you think about how all that played out, and and you mentioned, you know, a couple smart companies, and obviously Amazon being one of them that that realized that there was this opportunity. And when you look at, you know, a company that started off selling books, and and now sells, you know, billions and billions of dollars of stuff, and doesn't actually make any money on what they sell, but they make all their money <laughs> on selling their server capacity, right? So, or their well, data retail is capacity. always a, a questionable proposition because it's always been thin margins. I mean, think about what they do for a living is buy, get something from somebody else and then resell it. Yeah. And, and you're only ever going to get paid a, a small amount to do that. The margins there have always been thin. But just like the dirt example you gave, it's how much will you pay to get it when you want it? And what are some of those other services that are going with it? And in this case here, it's the massive amount of commute compute power um, that can be delivered to the enterprises. Yeah. That is an offshoot of that. And it just strictly came out of the, hey, we have all this excess capacity in non-peak periods. Being a retailer, yeah. obviously, at a scale for Q4. Yeah. Um, and then the rest of the other day, we got all this excess capacity. We should sell it. Boom, yeah. there you go. You end up with, you know, you end up with that finding a home in, in consolidation of enterprise data centers. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good example of, you know, where you realize there's an opportunity and you're willing to kind of take a chance and innovate on something that maybe is not in the core of your business. And one of the things, you know, if companies as they're looking to potentially enable subscription pricing, right? Um, I, I remember I was at Cisco Systems and, and uh, like in, this was in 2001 or 2002, I think we started looking at what uh, what was at the time called managed services, right? So it was yeah. like the the beginning of SaaS, right? And it was like how do we how do we price things? How do we go to market? So the I, it was really when we started getting into telephony, right? And people were coming and saying, hey, I don't want to buy a switch and a bunch of phones and a, all this stuff. Like I I just want to pay you know five dollars per user per month for my phones. Like how do you how can you do that? So we started looking at it. It's like wow, this really has massive implications across everything that we do from the way that we sell to the way that we market to the way that we support to the way that we license everything right it touches everything transact business so uh, i'm i'm curious to see because uh, you've seen a lot of these kind of transformations happen and and sap is big in, in subscription you know enabling subscription selling as well what what kind of trends are you seeing there or what you know what's your perspective on that yeah i mean it's this personalization right so you have on the b2c and b2b so on b2c side what you really see is exactly this, is that um, this flexibility to be able to just consume what you need and pay for just what you consumed. More and more of the consumers demanding that. I mean, back when we were traveling all the time, I was always really impressed when I went to European cities and saw how rapidly they had transformed to get uh, either e-bikes or e-scooters out in large numbers and then the ability to price and charge for that and run that infrastructure, how fast it happened. It went from non-existent in, and to the very next year, just being uh, everywhere, proliferating everywhere. And what, you know, that's, a, that, that's the kind of thing. Now, how do you do that? You have to be able to understand that you're gonna just charge for use. And, you're, you, you know, and then people have to feel that that, it, it, that meets their needs, that it's fair. It, it, it's an interesting dynamic to see how quickly a model like that can go from zero to a hundred um, so quick. So that tells you that the market is accepting of that concept and believes in the, in that that's right. You know, yeah. you're not fighting it. There's no market friction there. Just immediate adoption. Oh, okay. I'm going to use that from get to point A to point B and I'm going to pay X amount. I'm in right. Yeah. Decision made very, very quickly. So the nice thing about an approach like that, where you where you take this personalized approach and matching value specifically to the to the consumer, and then can just charge for that. That's that's a level of sophistication that most companies struggle with today to be able to get with. Now, if you go to, yeah. to the B two B side, it gets more complicated, right? Because you have long running relationships. Typically, it's not transactional, and there's going to be different points in which it, where the value isn't going to be equal, right? It's it, mm -hmm. it's it, it's going to go up and down um, over the course of that relationship. So it's much more difficult to execute in there. But we're seeing it more and more. And you use the compute example, and I think that's a that's a pretty good one. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's something that, you know, in that example you gave with the scooters, 
there's there was a you know, identified market need and there was the the ability from a technology perspective to fill that need very quickly. Uh, the problem with it from a competitive standpoint is that so many companies rush to do that, right? Like I was in Chicago in 2019. They were like they were doing this uh, this kind of trial of of running scooters, you know. And I think there were like eight different companies or something, or nine different companies. It's like as a consumer, I'm like I don't want to sign up for eight different apps, right? So then then it's like how do you consolidate that? And and uh, I mean they've down selected to to less, but um, but yeah, where there's in, in some cases, you're seeing that these, you know, these market needs are able to be addressed so quickly that everyone jumps in it. And then it's like, OK, now it has to kind of, you know, fair, you know, out the winners. But there's usually only one or two companies that actually get like that kind of network effect and actually end up winning. Right. If you put your finger on something that is one of the one of the things that will have to be conquered in the tech space and in the future, which is. The technology today has a very much a centralizing dynamic to it. And we can see it. You mentioned Amazon. You know, um, I could go to somebody like Netflix or some of these. And what you see is that you only have one or two winners. You have you have very few and a very steep Pareto of just how quickly it drops off from the number one to the number two. And then it just and it just flatlines. That's not necessarily a, a great dynamic. Now, I think technology can also overcome that, but we've we've now witnessed it in a number of places. You know, you're down to like two major cell phones, maybe three major cell phones. There used to be dozens, right? You, and you can go right down the list, even, even spaces that you would think wouldn't fall victim to this, like media and banking and airlines. All of them have gone through this massive consolidation. And if you look historically over it and what that does is every time we saw it, I go back, I always remind people, you go back to the Communications Act of 1996. Think how long ago that was. The telephone didn't change for literally 100 years. It was a landline connected to your wall or a wire, right, for year until that was deregulated. And then all of a sudden you had this explosion in the telecommunication that gave us the cell phone and the smartphone and, and everything else that came with it. It just exploded. When we get to these points where these things are massively consolidated, it is one of the few times where government does have to exercise some power to say, how do we bring choice or how do we bring some things out so that the marketplace does bring variety? Because we all know eggs in one basket, not a good thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and today's technology is a very centralizing and focusing type of capability because it just creates such massive barriers to entry it's hard for competitors to get in and get started and actually ever get going. Um, and right. it's a dynamic we have to be aware of in the tech space. Yeah, absolutely. We need to do everything we can to foster innovation and allow this, the smaller companies to continue to compete against the bigger ones and, and yeah. to you know, gain traction. Or we'll end up with no choice like we had with it. With yeah. Phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It'll just right. be like, right. and it won't change, right? You'll be the status quo and it just, and you'll have a hundred years of no innovation. Yeah. Yeah, well, you didn't like that that uh, that AT and T phone that they had just with the buttons on it that everyone had, you know, or the dial the dial ones. That was yeah. Just think, I mean, even you think back on it, I mean, I'm I'm sure if we had Gen Z here with us, they'd be, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, exactly. maybe, maybe we shouldn't date ourselves that way. So let's talk about the future for a second. Uh, we're gonna wrap up here, but I wanted to, you know, since we're talking about the past a little bit, let's focus on. I'd like I talk a lot about the future of pricing, the future of commerce. I've done a lot of talks on that and written some things on it. But one of the things I, I wanted to get your take on that um, as you know, someone that gets exposure to a lot of different angles and and the way technology is being used and the way that SAP is looking at the future. So just curious as to you know what you see in terms of the future of pricing and how SAP and you know and partners like Price Effects are working to enable uh, our clients to excel in the future. Yeah, I mean that that aspect of commerce, right? I'm seeing some interesting trends here where um, we're all acutely aware of what a dominating force an Amazon is in the retail space. And I see retail under tremendous pressure. I read a depressing report over the weekend about how many bricks and mortar retailers will cease to exist after 2021. I mean, the handwriting's on the wall from and these are legendary names that are that are that are going to go into bankruptcy. Very, very difficult to watch. But on the bright side of it, what I'm seeing is I'm seeing companies who understand brand starting to look at vertical integration using their own brand and their own presence, recognizing that their, their direct 
ownership or the direct interface to the customer is important. Being disaggregated at the endpoint in a commerce scenario is not good. It, 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 you will miss the signals from those customers that will lead your company down the wrong path. Right. So there some of these companies are doing it, and I'm seeing it in in places that you wouldn't expect, maybe the hospitality or entertainment industry where they're recognizing that. Wait a minute. We can actually do some things where we can vertically integrate, not in a consolidate or acquisition approach, but from a commerce approach and bring things together so that um, it makes for a good buying experience for their consumer. Mm -hmm. But it's not necessarily companies that they own, it's companies that they partner with. So I'm seeing a lot more partnering in the commerce space and then an aggregating along those to execute around brands. And sports is smart around how they do this. Um, retailers are starting to evolve around how they, how they think and do this. Specialty retailers, I should say, it's not that the, the the department stores, the Targets and the Walmarts of the world haven't figured this out, but more specialty retailers are starting to take on more of that because they have a niche and they're trying to broaden it and they're starting to look at that. And I think that's going to be a big dynamic. And it's one of those ways that choice does come into the equation because people, as much as people value getting something for a low cost, um, they also really value a unique experience with special products that are different. Absolutely. Right? Human nature, right? To say, oh, that's different. I haven't seen that before. And they are willing to pay for that. So the curation of really interesting things that go together, that create that relationship in that, I think that's the future that you're seeing in commerce. And of course, pricing plays a role in that, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, it, that, there's a, an instance there where it's not always necessarily the lowest cost. It, it, it's how it fits into that uh, that experience. And we're seeing that, like you mentioned, I think, um, uh, bicycles along this. Um, bicycles are definitely going through that where you, you see the lines blurring between bikes as recreation and bikes as serious transportation. Mm -hmm. There is nothing hotter right now. Go out and try to buy an e-bike. Oh, I've been, yeah, I've been there. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, I, I I wasn't really paying attention to the trend until I needed one to go for, I needed one to go from one place in the neighborhood to another place in the neighborhood that was too short to jump in your car, but sort of a pain in the neck to walk. Mm -hmm. So I wanted an e-bike and then I started looking into it and I could not believe how long the backlogs were and how hot the space was and also how innovative it is. Mm -hmm. When you see it's really compelling. So even not, and people think of it, maybe this is an urban phenomenon. It's not. This is really a, a, a big change and I think can take a lot of forms, uh, uh, a lot of great forms, right? Because it can take a lot of load off of the system that's mm -hmm. generally geared towards cars and push it towards bikes. Because look, let's be honest, people don't want to ride a bike to work because they want to show up all sweaty. Right, right. Now you got an e-bike, charges, it's really cost efficient, good for the environment. And you know hotter space. That's an innovation that's just sort of just sort of really taken off as a result of the pandemic. And you just see a lot of great innovative companies kicking out there. Yeah. I mean, although even even normal bikes are having a lot of challenges, and that comes down to the supply chain disruption supply to chain, large right. of the components. Yeah. I I like to wrap up with just kind of uh asking my guests uh, what they might be reading besides uh depressing retail reports over the weekend. <laughs> you caught me. You <laughs> caught me, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, so just anything like blogs or, or any any good books that you've read lately, um, you know, whether it's business or personal or anything, just uh, just like to to get a little personal, uh, you know, insight there. I think, look, I, there's there's no secret that I am always really interested in history. And in particular, I, I follow a lot of stuff around uh, lost civilizations or things from the past, um, you know, gone to Peru and and. and gone to different places to really see how did they do that? Like, what was life like then? And so I, I read maybe some some more arcane things around that because I always think you can't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. And there's so much to learn from the past in terms of how they solved particular problems and how, how they ran their societies and, and what they did are always left, you know, the breadcrumbs are always left for the archeologists to figure out. And mm -hmm. I find that that fascinating. The fact that we're still finding today with 
technology like LIDAR. And that The Lost City is one of the most recent books that I read around this, where they use LIDAR, this new type of um, um, radar, to really be able to look through the canopy and find out that there are these huge mega cities in South America that are just buried under the, you know, just, just uh, mm -hmm. buried under the forestation. Yeah. And that they're just coming to light now. And then the fascinating aspects of them where you see that the cities were arranged and they sort of match up to different constellations or all these crazy things where they, you know, they, they, they built the buildings uh, with an understanding of uh, acoustics or the level of mathematics involved to do some of the things that they did that we would have thought there's no way a primitive society could possibly have, have done these things. And there it is, the proof's right in, fr right in front of your face. Yeah. So I like history because it teaches us about um, where we've been in the past and where we could go in the future. All right, Tom. Well, thanks a lot for joining us. Um, really great conversation. I enjoyed it very much. Um, and uh, do you have anything that you'd like to close out with here? No, Gabe, it's always good seeing you. And uh, I think there's no hotter topic right now than than pricing. Uh, it really matters uh, to companies' success or failure. And it can be the difference between success and failure for companies these days. Absolutely. Well, I, I share that opinion and I, I appreciate yours. So thanks so much for being a guest. And uh, yeah, great talking to you. And uh, thanks everyone for tuning in to Pricing Matters. <laughs>